Hello, I'm Chris Athanas. I'm a KMP developer. We're talking about how to program from the ground up. Tech support's coming on Tuesday. We'll see. Uh, we're getting going to continue our journey down class-oriented programming style, which I have a love-hate relationship with because there's stuff that was good, and there's stuff that was bad, uh, or less than less than less than wanted. Um, here's the guy kicking back, making everybody confused. <laughs> So yeah, so at last time we were talking, or we, we saw a video of him talking about the design of C++ and why it was uh, never meant to be the OOP that Alan Kay was referring to, that specific use case, which you know generally uses yes, but not not everything. And throwing the kitchen sink in to like get a wider audience isn't always the best idea. Um, Imho. Uh, okay, so originally several poorly applied ideas that still haunt and confuse us. We're going to get into what those ideas are, uh, but we're very appropriate for his use case at the time. So I don't want to diss him too hard. It's just that he didn't, there was no pullback on the hype train and there never is. Okay, so just realize if there's a hype train, people aren't saying what the, what the trade-off is. Okay, so they usually call this OOP because... Um, but it's not OOP. It's actually class-oriented programming, which is why I call it COP, uh, C-O-P for short, um, because objects are not the main focus. It's actually these classes. Um, so classes is just a structure in memory that has all the same primitives and other structures as other structured languages had, but now it uh, adds function pointers. So you have functions associated with a struct, that's all it is. And I, um, I did make this little map of all the languages. Uh, and we're coming in, so we're, if we're C, if C here started influencing Smalltalk, which was around at the time, right before C, C, C with classes, whatever you want to call it, C++, comes in here. So we got Simula 67 coming in here, which he, he loved. Uh, but it was too object oriented. Uh, there's we actually had to keep. You know, it wasn't as efficient as he needed it to be because it was on big iron. They could afford to do that. And he was like, "I can't. I gotta get my paper done, right?" And that's his excuse. But he, okay, so uh, it came over here to C, and then he inherited uh, built on top of C. So this is right here, and he has got the OOP term, and that's at the conclusion if you want to look at that. So, um. So it's, it's his thing was built for simulation. So like sim, if you're like going to simulate a hospital, well, you're going to have a doctor and a patient and the hospital is going to admit patients. You have multiple hospitals and they're going to admit patients and have different specialties and be scheduled for certain things at certain times. And certain people have to be certain, all that stuff. All those things are a class, right? You have the doctor class. And then you have individual objects of individual doctors but they're all a type of doctor, right? They all might be doing their own little thing, have different state variables, right? But they're all the class of doctor, which is the class of employee, right? So you got this hierarchy that they're talking about. And that's where really this whole thing came from was building these simulations. That was the big idea. Everyone got went nuts and they could run these simulations instead of on those big machines, big expensive machines. He made it possible to run that kind of stuff on Machines that were at one tenth the power, or one one hundredth the power, even. Um, so yes, he deserves credit. I'll give it to him. But the hype train that went after it was a bit much, and it definitely confused people because he called it OOP. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna keep harping on this a little bit. He called it OOP, and he knew it wasn't OOP. He knew it was COP. He knew that. He even called it C with classes. Why don't you just call it class when you're programming? Because it wasn't taking off and he had to kind of fib a little bit about what it could possibly do to get people to support his thing so it could keep going. So that's what happened. That's why he deserves credit, but also deserves a little bit of like, dude, really? Okay, so um, widespread confusion. So what happened was that the, People took on this stuff and they, they saw it was everything, but they didn't really know exactly what he was talking about, how to arrange his, his, the programs. All they saw was the new keywords. They said, just use the keywords and everything's fine. That's why he mentioned in, the, in that video. He's like, the keywords aren't going to help you. It's just, a, it's just a way to structure something else. <laughs> and people don't, and of course, nerdy computer people like, no, we just do the thing and it does it that. 
And so they misinterpreted it. They really, it, people had a really hard time understanding that a Bob's it can have a, you know, a little piece of, a little structured memory can have function pointers to it. And that's, and it can just refer to its own data. Instead of a pool over here, it's referring to itself and the data is together. And the doctor runs around and you know his name and age and location. There's not a database over here with just an ID of the doctor and a database of all the stuff. It's, I mean, you could do it that way, but that's not how it was. It's just like, that's, that's how it, in, in, this, in the C++ land, every little piece is a little simulated little part. Okay. That was the idea. But people were like, oh, no, we can't. I don't understand how are we going to fit our program into this. So they started using the classes, these doctors, instead, they started to pigeonhole it into their, <laughs> shove it into their own, a shoehorn into their own uh, problem. And they started using, uh, Instead of the classes have instead of having functions inside of file names, they now put the functions inside of class names. That's what they did, and we can get into it a little bit. So yeah, so C plus plus is never meant to be the OP uh, encapsulation. So can we put data and code? So the big idea is, can we put data and code that uh, manipulates the data into a container object that is only accessible by the code in the container? Well, yeah, I mean. You can make it public, you make it private. Can we can we hide it? Because we're trying to hide stuff, right? And that's the whole idea of encapsulation is hiding this complexity away so you don't have to look at it directly. Um, that's the whole point. So a class, it defines this, this struct, right? And they usually have a capital C, a capital letter. That's always, that's a kind of a thing. They say, I have a capital letter on it. And the, the compiler may actually enforce that. And it has, a, has some sort of data associated with it. It could be very complicated data, um, pointers off to all kinds of stuff. Any associated with a struct, you can put it in here, same stuff. And then it has methods, which are just functions. They call them methods. It's a method because it's inside a class. It's different. No, it's different. <laughs> it's just, a, you think it's just the word struct here? They could have, could have went along with it, but no, he had to make it different. <laughs> and then they kind of was copying stuff that was already out there. And some people knew about it. And a lot of people didn't until this guy came along. Um, okay, and then there's a special function or a method called the constructor that when you create, when you allocate memory, when, a, when the program goes and says, I need to allocate a cat. It says, okay, I need to have space for the cat, which is gonna have this age. Uh, and it's gonna, okay, so when you when that comes allocated, it's like, well, do you wanna give it an age? Do you wanna, do you wanna initialize, do you wanna, Tell us its value when it's created. It's like, okay, it's like a convenient way. So it says, so this age right here, this dot age, so this this object's age <laughs> is the age. Okay, so it's initializing it. All right. No, it's constructing it. It's different. You mean it's just initializing a value when the object is created and says so it's random or zero? You can give it another value wherever it's convenient, like when you're creating it? No, it's different. It's a constructor. Why didn't they call it? They actually changed it to a knit in later language. Later languages, in other languages, they call it a knit. Doesn't it make more sense to make it a knit? Because it's actually not constructing anything. Actually, not creating anything. It's not allocating anything. Allocation has already happened. When you do this new down here, when you create this new object, it's it's, it's allocate it's allocate on the space some space for this cat. Somewhere in memory, somewhere. Don't tell me how to do it. I don't care. Just get when I give me the address back so I can refer to it later in this variable. That's it. No, it's constructing. The, the object is being constructed. Come on, guys. Stop with that shit. It's, it's bad. We gotta stop creating new names for the same old junk, okay? <laughs> it's, just, it's annoying. Uh, all right, because we have to every time you come into a new thing, we have to new a whole new vocabulary that's just the same stuff. Come on, and it's because if I do not do it, they will not accept my uh, my hype. They will not get the hype. They will not adopt my language, and I will languish in obscurity forever. And that's just not happening. <laughs> okay, all right. So start the program here. It, this is a function because it's not associated with a class. The main function is not associated with a class, so it's still called a function. If it's not associated with a class, it's called a function. But if it's associated with a class, it's a method. It's a method. It's different. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. I'm about to go back and go and I'm head, scratch my head and say, really? It seems like you're just calling a function. No, you're sending a message. <laughs> no, you're not. You're just calling a function here. 
that works on this data or call something else. Stop with that stuff. God, you need to get some social skills, guys. All right, so here's your class. All right, let's go so we can see the code at the same time. There's the class cat, and it has it. So it's expecting an age. So it's like the template, right? And expecting a, this function here to be associated. So when you instantiate an object, when, when it allocates it in memory, you instead you're instantiating. No, you're not. You're not allocating anymore. That's procedural. That's for structured programmers. We're object oriented over here. We instantiate. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> this guy I worked with, he was working on an OP project. He was the first one. He thought it was all gee whiz bang. And I was like, still like studying C. I hadn't really got into OP. I was like, still having fun with C and doing stuff with C because you can still get a lot done in the in, uh, doing Mac programming back then. In the early, uh, late, early, late 80s, early 90s. And I was like, uh, if I'm just like allocating memory, for a struct that I've got function pointers on, because I was messing around with that. I was like, isn't that the same thing? He's like, no. <laughs> he was such a dick. I can't believe this guy, Mr. Briss Brees. If you're going to watch this, I'm talking about you. Briss Brees, that's not his real name, but you'll know who it is. You're a dick, dude. <laughs> All the stuff you said was totally wrong. <laughs> I can't believe I was friends with you. You were such a total prick. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, so here's a more sophisticated view. So this is really what's going on. So here's the class template. When the compiler runs, it takes this little function right here and, and makes it and compiles it down to the machine code and, may, and puts it there in the in, as, a, as a function to be you know, a subroutine to be called. And then every time it creates a new object, it just creates the variables. It just leaves the variables here and then it has a pointer to the function. That's all it is under the hood. Ooh, that's different. It's not actually doing that. That's what it's doing, dude. Briss Brees. <laughs> what a prick. Anyway. <laughs> I wish him all the best. He's, pretty, he's a super successful guy. He's doing all right. But still, it's just like it's super annoying at the time. It's like when you're when you're trying to talk to someone and you're like trying to learn. Not trying, I'm not trying to dissuade you, dude. I'm just trying, trying to get to the truth. I'm not trying to say you're wrong or right. I'm just trying to like, do you know how the allocation works? Is he? Because I'm like, when doing taking this machine language course, this is like worth studying. Anyway, <laughs> he was trying to be a big guy because he was doing object oriented programming. <laughs> no, you weren't. You were doing COP the whole time. Stop. Okay, so instantiation or allocation of, of uh, an object for a certain class. Okay, when a new object is created, the class template, the object is called an instance of the class. Ooh, it's an instance. It just means one of. Oh, okay. Wow. Instance, object, same thing. An object of the class, instance of the class, same thing. The special constructor method is called when the initial values are the values are set. So yeah, right here, this is called when you first it's used, it's always the same name as the class. Goofy. I don't know why they did this syntax. This is goofy syntax, but whatever. I'm not gonna complain. This is what we're dealing with. So when you call it with an age, it'll initialize the value. Ooh, it's constructing it. <laughs> it's constructing the object. <laughs> I don't know how many times I would say, hey, an object just seems like a structure of memory, man. I'm like, no, it's different. <laughs> okay, it contains the values or stay the variables and pointers to the methods of class. That's it, that's, that's, that's it, what it does, that's it. That's it, this is it right here. This rendering problem right here is a bug. There's like quite a few bugs I found inside the markdown stuff. But anyway, moving on. Okay, so when an object is created, it's called an instance of class. Okay, we are into that. Method is just a normal function inside of the class. It can manipulate the variables of its object, call other methods of its objects, or other methods of, from other objects, from other classes. If they're public, right? If they're private, they can't. Nobody can call inside from a private to a private method. If it's public, everybody can see it. If it's private, you can't. Ooh, you gotta set the visibility of the of the method. Set the visibility. Oh, so you can either call from the outside or not. Guys, calm down with that stuff. I know you guys want to be all, oh, I'm such a big deal. Oh, I'm a big deal. You're being, you're slowing down the process. Let's, this is not the stuff, by the way. It's the problem solving stuff and putting this together in patterns that are useful for your use case. That's the stuff. Now I know what an object is and you don't. <laughs> <laughs>
So an object is this variables is the state of the object. The variables of this are the, the, the values of the variables, the state of the object are often made inaccessible from the outside, i.e. private and only accessible by the methods of its class or the methods of its inherited subclass. Okay, let's get into inheritance. We'll do that in a second. It's just, all right, only people that are, if I'm a cat, I, uh, and I'm, there's a special type called kitten, you know, and it has a, it has a meow class. I'm not, you know, I, we'll get into it. I'm, that's not the best example. I'm trying to make stuff up, but it's just, it's, it's, it's just all stuff makes so it's, 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 they over complicate the hell out of this. It's really simple. It's really straightforward. It's not this, all this stuff they make it into. And then, and then arguing about what it is or what it's compared to. And it's not the same thing at all is not helping. There's a special modifier, special modifier called static that makes a variable or method accessible without needing instance of the class. So, yeah. <laughs> so think of this thing where it's, you know, an instance, each instance has, has, it, has its own variable here. Well, Liam, there's a special instance of the class that's the static instance. It's associated only with, there's only one, it's associated with the class itself. Just, and only one. This was a mis I believe this was a mistake. I believe allowing for this does speed things up, yes, but it's also a mistake. Okay, let's get into it. So this loophole is the main reason I call it class-oriented programming and not object-oriented programming. This is another reason. Uh, the stack is a way to use a class as a namespace, which we'll get into. It's like just a, like a file name. It's using it as a name. So a file name is a namespace for all the stuff in it, right? Well, a they're using a class as a namespace for just a bunch of functions. Instead of having it in a file, it's now a class. And the way Java set it up, they totally map, map that because people were doing it so much. It's like, you guys are encouraging really bad bad behavior here. Codlin cleaned it up though, so that's cool. All right, or some of it, not all of it. Um, using static as a way, as a class and namespace to group together methods and variables that are related to each other, um, to work on the same data or other data which was also a problem. Um, this example, like the math class in Java, which is just a bunch of static methods and no data, right? It's just add, subtract, assign, cosine, blah, 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 blah. There's no data in that class, but you still have to use math dot. So you're still using that class, even though it's just a bunch of functions sitting somewhere. Um, that's all it is. There's no, there's no, there's no arrangement. It's just, here's all the math. So that's not really, that's not really object oriented. That's Straight up COP or structured, structured style for sure. That's structured style for sure. So using names and classes, uh, using classes and objects as namespaces and, or scopes, right? A scope for a bunch of functions lead to procedural type style code implementations. So people didn't understand how they could map this over. So they just, well, instead of using a file name, we're going to use a class name. Okay. So that's what they did. So there was all this work around trying to shove in what would normally be the person manager file on the procedural side of now is now the person manager class. So we're gonna, we can look a little bit, let's see what this one is. Where is this video? I think it's my buddy Igor, yes. This, we're gonna listen to him in a second, but, um, <laughs> cause he's the one that brought this attention to me. He's like, cause I couldn't figure out what the, what's going on, Igor. A Ukrainian citizen living in Russia, been working in America, totally crossing borders, unexpected to hear it from this guy, but he's blending the world and he's actually, he's, he's nailed it. He's nailed what the issues here, why we're having, the people have problems with this, understanding it and rectifying it like amazing. So I've actually done a couple projects using his examples. I'm using his examples a lot in the, in the boop section. So, um, and my, my, my app, Fred's uh, Road Trip Story Trip, all boop, boop style, which we'll get into. Um, but here it is. So we're, we're using, we're using the code here. We're using, so here we have a data class, which is like a struct. That's all it is. So it's got a bunch of data, right? But the thing that makes it a class is it's got a method, right? And it's, in Kotlin, they just call it fun. That's a function. That's all it is. Cause they say, let's just not drop this whole charade <laughs> this this charade of oh, it's a method it's a function who cares it's just a function so we've cleared that up in kotlin which is nice um and this is showing an example even if you know all the oop rules you can still do clp no problem you can do structured style programming no problem so here's a companion object this this creates 
us the static. They even took away all that keyword in Java and all that stuff. We're just like, no, it's a companion object. It's supposed to give you the idea. That's another, it's a special object that's right next to the class that contains values or functions. That's all it is. So you have a class, so you have an object that's associated with the class and then any ob objects made from that class. And that, 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 and no matter, you all, yeah, here we go. So you have the companion object here. So right here, we make a, we make a instance of this person class, right? Right here, so we make an instance of the person class and it's name, age. By the way, never store age like this. Never store it as an integer. <laughs> side side note here: if you store your ages as an integer and the, the year rolls over, you're gonna have to go back and update everybody's age to the new age, to the new age for the new year and every year. Oh, by the way, when do you do that? On their birthday? On the new year? Uh, do you do it at what point? <laughs> so you always. Store the birth date usually as a long, you know, as a number of seconds since 1971. Anyway, well, back on target, back on, back on subject at hand. Uh, so yeah, so this creates that static function thing. So here we go. So we create a an um a, create an object. We're creating an object of the person class, which is just a, 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 a allocated piece of memory that has name, age, weight, name, age, weight. Height, weight, and assigns that pointer, a pointer to that piece of data in memory somewhere to this variable function, uh, variable person. And then here, this is how you do it. And C, you would just go person dot blah is a new value. Person dot blah is a new value. So you're just directly accessing. You're not going through any methods, not going through any functions or nothing at all. But people took that. And they just put it in this person manager thing here like this. And they're like, instead of Jackson's directions, we're going to be object oriented now. So you pass in the person, the same person here. You pass it in. <laughs> it's the same thing as calling a function. No, it's different. We're calling it in a class. We're in... <laughs> it's so silly. Oh my goodness. Let's go into a little bit more advanced... Uh, uh, example. So we have a thing, the same stuff here. You have that same person with the with the method, the print method, and then we have a bunch of functions here. How you would do it in structured, the structured style. You would pass in a person. It would either print it out or change the name, or whatever. Directly access access it through a function, right? Instead of that, instead of directly accessing, you're going through a function, which has things you could do like set up. You can guard against bad values. You know. There's more complexity than here, but you could do more stuff. You're just not directly assigning it. You can, you know, make sure there's, you know, constraints are made or do a database call, you know, all that kind of stuff. Or then we have another class right here that's used strictly as a namespace as a, right here is, it creates this, this is all static. There's, you don't, you can call it without an object. You don't have to have an instance of the object to call any of this stuff. You call it directly on the class itself. And it's, the cool thing about the IDE here. Like here's, um, it'll actually show you like highlight stuff for you. Like what, what that means. Like this, this refers to this person here, this object, an object, an object of this type. And the name is actually pointing to that. Boop. And it's the same name here, same name here, same name here, same name here. That's just a cool thing about, uh, the ID that helps you out with that kind of stuff. If you got the highlighting stuff set up properly. Okay. So you can, you know, go through and change all the data, uh, and then just Print the person out, so that's the direct access, the normal structured way, procedural way of doing things. And then you have can call the function, which is you know the functional style, which we'll get into a little bit. But it makes a little more sense. You can do more processing here, and do some you know check, the, you do some guards, like make sure there's no blank names or you know or cuss words, you know, do whatever you want, right? You have some more control here, and then you have this class. It just creates. A person manager, which is just this like a static, just creates it's just a bunch of functions, okay? And then you just you're calling functions on it, okay? That's not really you're not really going, you're not you're just calling functions again. There's not really it's not object oriented anymore. There's no object here. It's just calling functions. And the people would argue with me about this that this that they would say no, this is still object. No, it's not. This is procedural. You're just using this as a as a file name. 
namespace. And here's another way they did it. They would actually instantiate. <laughs> they would have, oh no, okay, so we get rid of the statics. Okay, that was the problem. We just get rid of the statics. So no more companion logic. But now you have to create an instance of this object. This is very common. By the way, this is, this is called doing a use case. This is a use case. You create an object that just has the functions in it and do the same thing. You call, you call. <laughs> Are not on the object now. You're calling it. You're calling this thing that has these functions, but you're still passing in the object around and directly accessing it. Just like, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna fix these variables to be name. I let chat. I let chat GPT do that. And there's the output. It's always this, this is the same output, and just do different threes. So this this right here is they actually thought that doing this. Made it object oriented. Wow. Okay. It's class oriented stuff. So this is all the kinds of stuff that people were did took, had mistakes about. And go play with that code and see what it's like. Just mess with it. And that's what that's about. Um. So let's, uh, let's see. I don't want to get into interfaces yet. I want to talk about let's 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 let Yegor Bugayinko, the creator of Elegant Objects, wrote a book. It's a free book. Uh, about about this all this stuff. And he had a series of webinars. And this guy has been so helpful because he's actually interviewed some of the originators of OOP with the ideas they had. He's comparing it to alleging elegant objects. I kind of modified it a little bit, not not much, in my boop style, and I actually documented what my boop, the boop style is. It's basically his stuff, except a couple more constraints and just coding style stuff that uh, was helpful. Here you go. <coughs> go. Seems to be working. So, uh, so I think that most of you came to the webinar from my blog. So that's how you probably know me. And no, it came from me. We're just gonna be talking about the problem that you talk about a lot. I've got links to all that stuff, so you can. That's how you probably got interested in my content. So this is the first webinar for me. I'm not really, I'm not really an expert in this thing. So I will, I'm planning to do them uh, every month. So this is the first one, and most of them will be about. He, did it for, he did, still does it. He does it. He's been doing it for years, talking about all this stuff. Object-oriented programming, and specifically about object thinking, which I think is is the right way to to write open object-oriented software. So today is the first time, and uh, I have to say, I have to like. I have to say before we start is that everything I'm going to say today is basically my, my personal opinion. So I, I've heard a lot of uh, I've heard a lot of answers on my blog, a lot of comments about my, my articles, saying that this is not this is not a science. This is not something which the industry actually accepts. And I have to say that yes, this is personal. This is my personal opinion, and everything. Right, but it is the style that Alan Kay was talking about. Is whether it was the stuff that he was referring to with this. I think you hear from me is based mostly on my experience. Uh, I don't think that objects are very extensive experience. This guy's like hardcore capitalist, a little too hardcore for me. He's pretty, he has some interesting takes on like programming uh, methodologies and, and production, production methods, which I don't really agree with, but he's right on target with this uh, elegant, elegant object, object stuff and static methods, how they totally mess things up. During the programming core. <coughs> I'm sorry. <sighs> That's some energy saving in the room. <laughs> so I don't think that object-oriented programming is something which, uh, which is a strict science. It's uh, it's still it's still uh, a work in progress, and that's why every opinion counts. So mine should be as well. Uh, so the key point today, what I'm trying to express is that it's going to be about static methods, static methods, and their object-oriented alternatives. So the main the main main thought, the main idea I would try I would try to convey is that uh, static methods are really an evil thing in object-oriented programming, and they have to be uh, completely replaced by proper objects. So every time you see a static method, you have to understand, well, we have to understand that something is wrong in the software and it should be refactored. That's the main, that's the main idea. Now, just by, I just want to say out loud, his opinions are very controversial, but he, what he's trying to do is get rid of a whole class of bugs that plague these applications and aren't never going to get rid of them until we start doing this kind of stuff. Uh, so the agenda will be, we're going to spend one hour on this. And the agenda is that, first of all, I'll give a little bit about the theory, like why I think so. Well, we're not going to stand an hour, but we're going to. Introduce you. You should go listen to this whole video. It's awesome. The second one, I'll give you a practical example of uh, what, how I like, how I, uh, how I faced the problem with the static methods in Java, and how I resolved it myself in one, in one of the open source frameworks I'm working on now. Then uh, I will try to answer a few concerns uh, people expressed on the blog in the comments, and I will try to give the answer to them. Uh, and then I'm, I'm hope I hope you will have some questions for me, and I'll be able to answer them. So let's start with the theory. Uh, let me show you first. Let me share a piece of code with you. 
and I'll explain what the static method is about. So here's the here's the code. The first piece of code, this one, is well, you, you probably understand what it does. It's like a, it's a small class. Okay, final just means you can't extend it. That's all it means. It's class pairs is Java. So private means it's it's only available in when you're inside this class inside the class. Like the only thing, it's only a method inside here can access things. Nothing outside here can access it. The only inside here. So this dot left is this one. This dot right is this one. It's an integer. It's final, meaning you can't override it. You can't change it for this. This is like inheritance stuff, which is just like we'll get into it. It's not that big. I was like, come on, stop about the making a big deal about this, which compares. Uh, to integers and returns the biggest of them. So the class is a pair, and this method returns the biggest value in the pair. It does this by the help of this, it's a Java code, by the help of this static method, this utility class, math, and there's a static method max in this utility class. Right, so we talk about utility class as a static class. It has no, it doesn't have, the object has no values in it. It's just a bunch of function pointers. Pointers to methods, that's all the math in Java. So it's not even, so this is the, even in Java, it's not object oriented. It's just procedural style, structure, structured style. So I think that this is wrong, and this is right. It's exactly, well, almost exactly the same class, but it also encapsulates two numbers, and it also returns the biggest of them. But it does it differently. It does it by the instantiation of uh, of, a, of an object, and then it returns an object instead of returning a scalar integer here. It returns uh, an object of type of, of interface number, and this object is a maximum between, well, a maximum of these two numbers. So I think. So do you see the difference there? One is calling, just calling a function. One is creating an object that inside it will result in a number. So this isn't creating anything on the memory. There's no memory being created here. And this is actually creating a little, a little allocating a piece of memory. And then using that, using the encapsulation, which we'll get into, to to do the true OO. I believe that the first example, this one, is terribly wrong. And this is way better. It's not perfect. No, not terribly wrong. He's just trying to be, he's being, he's over-exaggerating here a little bit. But he's trying to make a point. The second one is not perfect because it still needs refactoring. But the first one is terribly wrong. So why is that? Uh, I think that static, let's, let's, get, let's step back a little bit back to, uh, let's try to compare the procedural. This is procedural programming. This is object-oriented, this is more object-oriented, and this is procedural, why is that? The procedural programming, it's the idea, how did the software looks in the procedural program? Uh, the application is a long, uh, a long set of statements, which are supposed to be executed one by one, starting from the entry point and finishing at the exit point of the software. This is how C software is designed. You have the main function, and this main function gets control when uh, receives control from the operating system, and then it goes statement by statement until the end. If you write the long main function in C or in assembly or in basic, in all these procedural languages, you will end up- Which we've seen all of them. <laughs> it's crazy that he knows he's bringing up all the same stuff I've been talking about this whole course. Up with a very long, very long function. We call it fun basically it's a procedure. So it's gonna be very long listing, like multiple, many thousands of lines of code. In order to decompose this problem into smaller pieces, they invented procedures, which are basically pieces of code taken away from the main function. Subroutines, functions, it's all the same stuff. And placed somewhere else and labeled somehow. We call the procedures with the name and parameters. And then you may call them and the execution will go there. They will continue there using the stack. So you pass the parameters into the sub procedure. Then the execution will continue in the sub procedure and then we'll return back to the main procedure. So you can break down the big scope of, of the problem into procedures and sub procedures. And that's called uh, software engineering. The breaking down of the of the breaking down down that's called that's the engineering because you got to figure out which box goes where which order where how what is it doing yeah but you break and then you break it if you can't break it if you can't solve it there you break it down you break it down you break it down you break it down but still the entry point of the software is at one point and then you go through all these statements one by one you continue to execute till the software ends till the end of the till the end of the application or script execution this is how this is how the procedural programming is is, is uh uh it's actually, let me stop this, you can see me again. So this is how the procedural programming is uh, intended to, to decompose the problem into pieces. Decompose, as opposed to compose. So compose is you're bringing things together, and you're composing some bigger thing made up of smaller things. And decompose is you're taking those, that group, that big problem, right? And you're flipping it up and you're decomposing it. <laughs> These words are so funny. 
and, and that was that was that that decomposition method actually has problems, and uh, that's why object-oriented programming was invented, because if you decompose that way, you will end up with a software which is very unmaintainable and difficult to uh, difficult to extend and difficult to uh, uh, to refactor or to 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 add some features and to fix the bugs, because every time you're basically dealing with uh, with a long, with the, the scope is still big, and you always you're always uh, managing the uh, the data which goes through all these procedures. Right, you're managing the data as it passes through all these functions. Right, that's the thing. As opposed to managing, you know, as opposed to this different style, which we're going to get getting into, this object oriented style. So, what? And at the but at the very bottom, it's always going to be structured. It's always going to be procedural. At the very end of the day, when it's inside inside those functions, still procedural still functional, then, you know, we're using it inside these objects that are, have, instead of having arrays of lists, we have individual objects floating around doing things to each other. <laughs> deeper and deeper into, into a smaller procedures. So basically it was difficult to maintain this kind of software. That's why object-oriented programming was invented. In the object-oriented programming, the de de to decompose the problem into pieces, you, you do it completely different. You, uh, you break down, you, you present your whole software as a big one object, which is composed into which com which encapsulates smaller objects inside, and you wire these objects one to another, uh, mostly through constructors. Not and that's that's the oh this is the oh we talk about the OOP style. Uh, I believe that's called this is what we talk about the Allen K style, and the COP blends this stuff, but he's more referring to s s classic Allen K style OOP. Smaller objects inside, and you wire these objects one to another, uh, mostly through constructors, not through functions, not through method calls. So the entry point to the procedure, to the entry point to the procedure is actually this, this function or procedure, which is the, the data which comes in and then the amount of statements. But with the object, the, the, the entrance, the entry point of the object is a constructor. So in OOP, when you design the software, you break down the problem into small elements, which are objects, and then you wire them together through constructors. So you allow one big object to encapsulate multiple other objects. And these smaller objects also encapsulate smaller objects through constructors. So in OOP, the functions are small, really small, like a few lines of code. But the constructors are, well, the constructors, the object, they have more constructors and small and, and less functions. So the, the decomposition, the decomposition problem in procedural programming is different from decomposition in, in, in object oriented programming. It's a, you have to change your brain around for sure. That's the key difference. It's just a different way of looking at it. It's not really change your brain. It's just a different perspective. You're looking at it from a different, from a different angle. So looking from the bottom, looking from the top, looking from the side, looking from the side. In the code, which I've showed you just before, let me show you again. Yeah, in this code, when you use the static function, uh, the, existence, the existence of this function actually encourages you to turn this function also into a static function. And then remove these two things and put them here. Yeah, won't that be even faster? Yeah. But that's where you, your software will get if you, if you keep using static functions and you- Back to procedural, mm -hmm. back to structured style. Because it is, it's like what we come up and learn, right? We, everyone came up and learned the same way. <clears throat> and everyone and everyone usually does learn the same way. You don't learn from the top down. You usually start writing some code. So you're, you're in this procedural, this is like functional way of thinking. It's, it like gets unstuck a little bit from that style, you know? And a lot of guys have been doing it for like what, 20 years by this time. And like, it, it worked. They wanted to get the job done. And the OOP is like, oh, okay, it's gonna solve all the problems. Okay, we'll do it. And then didn't solve the problems. They're like, ah. You keep liking them and you keep uh, uh, appreciating them. So eventually, it's like, it's like a cancer in the object-oriented programming. It will eventually cover your entire code base. Eventually, all of your functions will be static because you will see no point in encapsulating anything because this is way faster. This is less lines of code. It's gonna work faster. And it will look for you, if you think in procedural way, it will look for you like a perfect procedure from a C style. From, from, from the way you decompose the problem in procedural programming. So this will look like a perfect uh, design for you. And then, and then you will eventually turn your, your pair class into a utility class, which will have all And then everybody who- A math class, just a bunch of functions. Actually is using this pair class, will also think like, why do we need this to be a class? Why do we need to make an object of this class? We can just make call this a static function. And then for, for me, if I'm a client of this function, of this object, sorry, of this class, then I also don't want to have the, uh, the proper object. I can use only static methods. So. If you go that way, if you keep using static, static, static methods, public static methods, then your whole software, your entire object-oriented software, which will, will become not an object-oriented, but a software with a procedural decomposition. So you will actually get back to C programming in a Java syntax. You will have the Java libraries. You will have the-, uh, the... And I have worked on so, not a lot, enough projects to be like, what are you guys doing here? And I 
figured it out finally doing this stuff. They're using procedural functional style programming, but throwing them in classes and they're like, you guys are not, you guys aren't winning here. <laughs> Actually get back to C programming in the Java syntax. You will have the Java libraries, you will have the, uh, the Java syntax, all this you know, Java uh, convenience, which is Java is way more convenient than C, but, but the code will look that the design will be perfectly, will be purely procedural in a C way, in an assembly way, in a basic way. So that's my point. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit too theoretical, maybe it's really, really too, too abstract, but this is, the main, this is the main idea which I'm trying to convey. So the static functions, they are actually static methods, public static methods. They encourage us as programmers to think in a procedural way and decompose our, um, our scope, our bigger problem into pieces, into, into procedures, not into objects, not into, like in this example, not into, into small living organisms, like I call them on the blog, uh, which, which encapsulate other living organisms. And then uh, they... Uh, I, I wouldn't use the word ligand organisms. Other uh, other other objects. There actually are objects th that have methods, and you have to actually call them. You can't go dig into their data. You're not allowed to go into their data. There's no. You're not. You have to ask nicely. It'll give you the data back if you if you want. He, he goes into more detail about what they what he means by that. But it's like you're not you're not directly accessing. You're you're going through. Everything's going to go through a function that that the method owns, right? Or that the uh, that the class owns. It's, you're not going directly in. Direct, going directly in super fast, yeah. But you're, you're losing all the OOP stuff that Alan Kay was talking about, how you can compose your application to have a lot less bugs and a lot more understandable in, in many ways. For you know, certain classes, it's like this is just a style, right? This is one of the styles. It's just – go ahead. Jason. They, they expose the behavior and expose probably other objects through some methods. And also, uh, if you – this also like static methods, the, the way that you compose into procedural way is uh, – also will encourage you to use a lot of debugging. So if you, if you use debugging, if you use this thing like going through statement by statement deeper and deeper into functions and static methods, uh, if you use this debugging feature in, the, in the, your uh, IDE, this means that, uh, that you're doing something wrong. It means that you're in a procedural world still. Because in the object-oriented world, you don't use debugging at, well, you don't use debugging at all. Well, I would disagree with that, but he's trying to get you to think like, it's a different way of thinking about the problem. He's trying to get you to like, okay, so we're going to not debug our way through this if we have to like d or design and organize our way through this. Because all your objects are quite small. They're really small. And all you need to test them and all, the, and all you need to, to make sure they work is to write a small unit test for a small object and, uh, and see how the object behaves. And all that means is a little exercise, a little, a little tiny program like I've been showing already that, that demonstrates what it does. That's all a unit test is. So it's, just an, it's just an exercising of the function. You're calling it with different things and making sure it comes back with the same with the different values that's all it's doing it's just another program that runs that calls the function it's nothing crazy it's in a unit test you don't need to go deeper and deeper in, in a procedural way in a, in a in a flow control execution way i don't know how to call it but if you if you really need to go through function Imperative. to function going deeper and deeper in stack and seeing how data goes through through functions to functions that means that you are working in a c world in an assembly world not in object oriented world right so that's what I wanted to say. So there are basically two different types of thinking, procedural versus object-oriented. And when you use static methods, you are uh, basically going back to the procedural programming, even though you're in Java or Ruby syntax. Ruby is saying that uh, they, it's an object-oriented language, but the, the language, it is object-oriented, but the libraries they provide, the standard libraries from Ruby, they are full of the static uh, utility classes. Right, right. that's a big problem with these uh, so-called OO languages. They're still full of all the static stuff because it works, it's convenient. For the math functions, you probably do want them to go fast. So, I mean, He's just, he's just comparing and contrasting and letting you know uh, what, what th that there. Let's watch just a little bit more of Yegor with this, because he comes out with these okay. slides. How and this is super useful. Uh, so he got, he upgraded, <laughs> he upgraded his, his thing. To, um, this is eight months ago. So the, the first thing we saw was, was actually his first video. So he started to kind of, he was sketching out the ideas. By the time he got here, He's got it. Like he's he's nailing it so hard. This is related to challenges or problems of object-oriented programming. So we're going to discuss static static things, static methods, static attributes, and in the end, we'll look at the real Apache. You know what I say? You have to. You have to, can't trust them if they're a little bit gray. You have to, if you have, to, if you're not gray, you haven't gone through some of this stuff and realize it's it's like this is our life. This is our time we spend. Let's make it good for ourselves. Let's make it easier ourselves. It's already hard enough as it is. Uh, library and not Apache. Sorry, this library is not uh, is not in the Apache family. But we'll take a look at the open source library and uh, criticize what they what they do there uh, from the perspective which we discussed in the first part of the lecture. As you remember, in the beginning, uh, in the in the first lecture, I told you that there are a number of things which um, which make uh, 
object-oriented programming uh, not as elegant, not as effective, not as beautiful as it, as it can be. Um, and we're going to get rid of those things. So one of these things, the first one, maybe the most important, is the static, static, uh, uh, static flavor which people add to many programming languages. The static methods, they exist in Java, they exist in uh, C++, in Python, in Ruby. In, I don't know actually a language where such a thing would not exist, object-oriented language. So they always try to put something static. And we'll see what I mean by the static. Um, again, the lecture is, is split into three parts. First, we discuss, discuss static methods, then we discuss static attributes, and then we go for the example. So we'll go through the code written by... So other we're just going to listen to the static methods stuff, but you just should listen to this whole thing. But we're just going to listen to the methods part. The people and I will, uh, I will piss on the code <laughs> and criticize it as much as I can. So first, the methods. Um, so what static methods are for? So if you look at the, at the two examples, two pieces of code, on the left side you see the, the, the code with the static method, on the right side without the static method. I'm sure you are already uh, good enough programmers to understand uh, both uh, pieces of the code, so you know what is a static method. So we're not discussing in this course how to write object-oriented software. We're discussing, we assume that you guys already understand what how to write, for example, Java code, but now we just... Uh, okay, you don't know yet, but it's super simple. We were already talking about this. this is a structure of data, some data memory. This has a, a publicly accessible float, meaning that anyone can look at it. Any any of these, any other thing can, can look at that float. It's floating point value is called radius. That's That's it. And then we have another class called Geometry Utils. It's got a static, so you don't have to have an object of the class to, to, to call it. You just call geometryutils.calcsquare, and it accepts a circle, and it takes that circle's radius, right? This is publicly available, and that circle's radius times, times, and then times 3.1.4, which is pi. So 2 times 2 pi r squared, <laughs> and it returns it. So it returns it as a float, a floating point number. So whoever calls this calc square, geometry tools of calc square with a circle is gonna get back its radius. Wow. So calc square really means calc square radius. All right, fine. And then we have this other thing over here. It's got a publicly available float. And inside it is a, is a, is a function or a method, whatever, same thing, called square that returns this radius, this, the radius radius. Well, if you don't see anything that says, in the, if you're inside of a class and there's nothing in front of you, that means the one, the this, the 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 the, uh, the data inside the object, inside that particular object, this means this one right here. And when you look, we click on the ID, you can it'll actually show you that it's pointing to this one. So and it's also publicly available, uh, and this is a public method as well. So anybody can call this. And once they, have, if you make a new circle object, you can then call this method on the on it. It'll give, and it'll give you back. The uh, the radius. Now, if one thing that's missing here is it's is it's the constructor where it initializes the radius. So that's he kind of left that out. But it, I mean, he may talk about that. I don't know, but that that is missing here. And okay, so he's not perfect. How to do it better? So I will not explain you the the, the elementary uh, things about the code. Just I just did that. <laughs> assume that you understand it. So on the left part, you see geometry utils. This geometry utils has a method calc quest square which expects a circle expects a, uh, an object of uh, type circle to come in, and then it calculates the square of the circle. The example is super primitive. How does it calculate? It just takes the radius, so it takes the public attribute from the circle, and then takes it again, multiplied by p and by pi, and then return the, return the result. Um, there could be many things like this, the utils, the, 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 the static methods. They are just staying in some global space, so this, this method, uh, these methods uh, calc... Just be clear, this is the static method, because it says static here. And you don't have to have a new, you don't have an object called geometry, geometry utils, you call it. You just call geometry utils dot calc square, boom, and you just, uh, the, the calc square of the circle. <laughs> I don't know why he says it's called squares, it's to be called radius. So some of his slides are messed up. We'll square let him have that. There is available for. Uh, available for uh, for everywhere in the program, so we can easily. If that would be, for example, C language, we can just take this method and move it outside and put it here and call it just global function. Right, same thing, same exact thing. It's actually doing the exact same thing, except you wouldn't be geometry tills anymore. It would just be calc square. Just call calc square in the global space, and then you better hope there's no other calc square in the global space namespace because it'll clash with it. That's why they start using this as like a namespace. That's why. So this geometry utils in Java is actually more like a namespace. So it's not really a class. It's not really because we don't make an object from that. So we don't make an instance of this geometry utils. It's just a namespace. It's just a holder of static, of the holder of procedures. And this is one of the procedures. And there could be many of that inside this uh, geometry utils, many procedures there. And people put them there because they don't know where to put them. So they don't know where to put them. 
And I, oh my God, it's another thing. I would say, why are we putting these things in classes like this? It seems like these are just functions. They would not, have, until, oh, it took a while for them to admit, like, we don't know where to put them. In Java, you, in Java, which was all the Android stuff I was doing, it has to be, everything that has to be inside a class. Now, Kotlin doesn't do that, but in Java, everything has to be in the class. You can't have any functions just out on their own. And that's all tutorialed. Basically, the static method, these this, uh, this utility classes, they are usually aggregators of global procedures. Of Aggregator, right? So they just collect a bunch of procedures together, throw them over there. We don't know where to put this. And you'll see in these, when you ever go to a code base, you'll see util just be like, <laughs> a bunch of random crap. Not even just like, we don't know where to put this, sir. Just put it in util. Just put it in the util class. <laughs> procedures which otherwise would be globally available. And they make procedures for you know, managing uh, files, for managing uh, streams, for managing like a, like a... Right, for the system stuff, it makes sense. Okay, we can have exceptions, but as a general rule, no. Here, the geometry uh, thing, for managing mathematical operations, like in Java, we have this class, which is called mass. So in the mass class, or which is not really a class, but the namespace, you can call, for example, the functions. It is a class, but it's being used as just a namespace. It plays a dump. We don't know where else this goes. It's not a person, it's not a house. Uh, you know, we... What do you put sign? Put it in the math class. <laughs> the same function is this, this the sinus, you know, to calculate the sinus of a of an angle. And this mass is actually not a class, but a, a like a namespace. But still, people call them classes, so they're not calling them namespaces because maybe because in Java there are no namespaces, and in many other languages there are no thing, things like namespaces. But in Ruby, for example, we have modules, which are namespaces, and they're people. They call these things modules. Another one, the word that's over every language is going to use that sort of word differently. Module, project, well, projects use the same, but module can be so many different things. Well, just define global functions. So I'm here talking about not only static methods, but in general global functions and global variables. So static methods, global methods, global functions. Just like in basic and in assembly, you can access anything anytime, anywhere. There's no, no protection or anything. That's what it, this, is, this is the problem. Global attributes, global variables, static attributes, they're all the same. It's all the same category of creatures, and they are all bad things. Why? I'll explain you later. But now just understand what I'm talking about. It's shared mutable state. Different parts of the program can access the same thing, and they may not know they're not supposed to do that. The alternative impl implementation without the static method is here. So here we have a class circle. It encapsulates the radius. You see, it's oh, that's a mistake. It should be it should be private, not public. So now it's it's private, so nobody can accept that. And then we call the method. Okay, that's why I figured we should probably make it private. But it still has to have a, 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 a um, constructor. It doesn't have a constructor here. But it, he's just probably going to say, yes, there's a, just a, a, imagine there's a constructor here. So he's a like, new circle, and you give it the radius. OK. Square. And the square calculates the result and returns the result out. So now we're not allowing anybody to take away the radius and, cal and do the calculations outside. We just encapsulate everything inside the circle, the functionality and the data. And this is the data, or like we discussed before, the state. Now what he's doing here is a simple example to get the concept. In reality, you would keep all kinds of data in there private, all kinds of stuff that doesn't need that nobody else needs to know about out from the outside. But internally, we need to keep track of that stuff. So this is just a simple example. For the data, which which is encapsulated in the object, and this is the behavior. So this is behavior, and this is the state, and they're all inside an object. And we the object does everything it's supposed to do without letting anybody outside of it to have any functionality. Because look at this, this functionality of calculating the square actually stays away from the class circle. So if you look at the circle, you will not understand that the circle actually can have a square. Like if they stay, of course, next to each other, then you can see that. But if you... Right, and that was a big problem with the procedural stuff. We don't know what data goes with what types. I mean, we don't know what... what, what sorry, like, we don't know what functions go with these data types. We don't know how they're all... Like, they're all just one big flat thing. We don't know how what goes where. Though that's the whole idea of the objects. Like, well, for this particular data, here's the functions that work on that. That was the idea of it. That was the concept. Because these, because you would look at a code base and like, you'd see a bunch of functions, a bunch of data types, and then you'd see a bunch of procedures, and you'd have to actually go down and look at all the functions where everything's at. It was a mess. It was a mess. So just imagine the hundreds of these in other files somewhere else. You don't know that to calc the square, you have to go over the geometry utilities unless you've already looked in there. It's, it would be much more convenient if I want, if I know that there's a circle object and it has it now has a, a, the ability to calculate its square that it's already right there. I don't have to go look around. That's the big idea. 
split them if you move to different places, and you're not going to see that. And like here, you read there are many, many examples of, this, of these things which exist in Java. So this is what static methods are for, to put the functionality which you don't know where to put, to put it somewhere and call it somehow. So in my opinion, this is basically what lazy programmers do who don't have enough time or creativity or... So this is why he's a little controversial. <laughs> you can't, don't show your boss. Somehow. So in my opinion, this is basically what lazy programmers do who don't have enough time or creativity or uh, skills to think where to put their, the functionality, where to put the behavior, how to design the object properly. They just say, okay, I don't know. So I will make a utils class. I will make the, the place where everything will stay and just put the functionality there. So what's wrong, specifically wrong with utils? I define three things which are wrong with these utility classes, with the collections of static methods. First, these static methods, not only utils, but in general static methods, they are unbreakable dependencies. I'll explain you now what it means. Unbreakable in a few words means that these two classes, like the one who is calling these geometry utils and the geometry utils, they're connected to each other. You cannot break it during the testing. So he's talking about they're totally coupled. The coupled cohesion that he's talking about, these things are locked together. So you can't, it's very difficult to test it because they're, locked together. You only got one static. The app only has one. So you can't have a bunch of these testing functions calling this all at the same time. You're going to have all kinds of issues. You have to do them one at a time, which slows down the whole damn thing. Yeah. So many problems, right? So many problems with just having one around that not to have the ability. It's mostly the testing of exercising this thing. Can we have an automated way to making sure that we haven't broken anything? That's the whole idea of the testing. It's like not to make sure it all works. No, it's like if we're gonna start changing stuff. We don't know when, when we don't want to know if we broke something over here. It's so easy, even in this OOP land, super easy to break stuff. And you don't know what you break. You're not gonna go through the whole damn program every single time you change one line. No, nobody got time for that. I'll show you now. Second, they are eager and not lazy. There are two approaches to uh, to programming, which one is called uh, eager, which one is called lazy uh, evaluation. And another is eager evaluation. Lazy evaluation is that when we evaluate things as we're being as lazy as possible, evaluating the result only when it's really necessary. Eager evaluation. Right. Meaning that when we boot up the program, we don't really need to download the internet. We only need to download pieces of the internet that somebody asked for. If we're going to download the entire internet, that's called eager. If we're just going to take down another piece at a time as we need it, that's called lazy. <laughs> it's so stupid, like these words are just computer science work. It's an eager, it's an eager algorithm. <laughs> you mean it's just loading everything when you start it? <laughs> it's a lazy algorithm. It's totally, this one's so lazy. Oh, you mean just waiting until the last second until you have to go get the information for whatever you need? Oh, it's lazy. <laughs> it means that we evaluate it right now. So let's, again, I'll show you the example now. And number three, the problem number three is that utility classes are not cohesive. Probably you've heard about this word cohesiveness. There's, there, there are two basically fundamental properties of any software code, coupling and cohesion, especially in object-oriented programming. Uh, maybe if you don't know, there's a coupling and uh, yeah, coupling and cohesion. So coupling has to be a good speller for being Russian, Ukrainian, or heck he is. To be uh, tight. He's Ukrainian. The, 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 uh, sorry, the, the coupling has to be loose, weak coupling or loose, I don't know, maybe weak coupling. Yeah, maybe loose is the right word here. And cohesion has to be uh, high cohesion or tight cohesion. Right. So if you want to have a person, we have the age, height, uh, uh, hair color, uh, weight, but not their dog. Unless it's an app that's tracking, the, tracking somebody's like a veterinarian office. But normally you wouldn't name the dog when the person. You wouldn't have the dog listed. That's like an optional thing. That's another list. That's another list someplace else. That's called high cohesion, having the name ages. And if it's low cohesion, you'd have the dog and their their cousin and you know their car make and that model. That would be that would be low cohesion because those things don't really make the guests together. They don't really, really. You want to have things that are coupled, like the age, name, um, height for the person. That's highly coupled to the person and and lowly and like other things like the car that they own. And the the dog that they the animal that they own and where they live, that's someplace else. That's low. That's low cohesion, and low 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 coupling. So they are quite the opposite, two opposite to each other. Not the opposite, but they yeah. are. No. I mean, they're mirror images of each other. Um, they are orthogonal, I would say. So they're not opposite, but uh, coupling means that uh, coupling means that uh, one class uh, and then another class. So they know too much about each other, like in a couple, you know, a wife and a husband. So they know about each other too much, and they're coupled so much that we cannot break them. We cannot just say to this class, the class number one, this number two, we can't. It's super easy to do this too. 
by putting too much stuff in these in these objects and not and not breaking down the problem properly and throwing stuff in these into these uh, classes that doesn't belong there. That should be you should be putting the house over here. It's like no, we're gonna put the house in there, and then later on down the road, it's like we should not have the house in here. <laughs> I'd say to the class number one, just don't use class number two. Use number three instead. So breaking this dependency is very hard because class number one already married to the couple to the class number two. So they are so much close together that we cannot during testing we cannot say hey for for, for a moment. Just forget about this one and please work with this one, which is, for example, a mock, which is a fake uh, implementation, which is some, something which we want you to use right now temporarily. Right, just to, just to see if the functions are all still doing what we thought they're supposed to do. Against this pre-existing set of data, we know it's supposed to these, if you call this function with these values, it's supposed to do this. And you can do that through the whole app and then, you know, a series of functions together and, you know, just make sure it's all, everything's working properly as much as you can. So, I mean, you can never get everything, but you can, like, uh, build it that way. And from the ground up, so it's, you know, not only do you know everything's going to work, but you have somebody come on the team that can look through the test and like, oh, this is what this thing does. It does a thing, it does this, it does this, and I can do this with it. Oh, that's how you do that. Oh, if you set it up like this, it does this. Oh, okay. It's like documents, like live documentation. It's like I've been doing in, in this document. It's like all that stuff, like code has to run. I don't, you better believe I tested before I put it up there. <laughs> Can't do that. That is called unbreakable dependency because the coupling between them is very, so this unbreakable dependency is related to this problem. It's too much coupling between them. But cohesion is about something else. Cohesion means that if you have some, uh, some class, some block of code, some module, some class, and then inside this class, you have some elements which are related to the class. For example, this is the class and this is the methods. Method one, method two, method three, method four, method five, method six. Six methods. Change it, so if it's a person, it's to change the age, change the name, change the address, you know, change the thing that's part of that person, class. It's the, uh, the items inside it. Just the methods modify the data. You don't can't go from the outside to modify the data. You have to call the method, which will you know make sure you got the right parameters, that you are logged in correctly, and the person exists, all that stuff. That's in the class. So cohesion means that they all need each other. So they all are somehow related to each other. So for example, this class is called circle, and then the methods are calculate the square, calculate the perimeter, move the circle, paint the circle. But there will be no method which is called, for example, uh, a save. A delete, let's say, all these methods were about the circle, and then we have a method which is called delete file. So in this case, if we put delete file into the class circle, there will be obviously uh, a low cohesion between them. So this, this method will stay here like a very strange element in the class. It's right. completely very common, coming people coming from the structured procedural style, to do that by accident. Because in structures, everything's everything, everywhere. It doesn't really matter. It's all just functions anyway. We're ignoring that part of the structure. Now we're using only this part of the structure in this particular function that's like... That was the mess we got into uh, pretty easily. I'm going to let you listen to the rest of that. And we are going to get into more, um, maybe a little bit more on the utility classes, on stack methods. I think that's our, our um, I don't know, we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do next. But we're, gonna, we're getting close to getting into interfaces. Ooh, interfaces. It's not just a common way of describing a set of, a set of functions, no. It's an interface. <laughs> we'll keep going. Hey, give me a like and subscribe. All right.